day three of week three of our online course. Today we get to the big one, myth four, uh, part one of it, but uh, cohabitation. And if we were in class, this would probably take us uh, you know, a solid week to get through because we would probably have much more uh, debates and conversations. And today we're going to only do part one because it is a big topic. Uh, don't forget though, Thursday is our test, so we have part one today, Thursday test, Friday part two. Um, before we begin, I, I forgot to mention twice now uh, the record that was behind me, and I meant to uh, play a song from this. This was uh, from a band called Bad Bad Not Good, but uh, they're they're kind of like a uh, trip hop, but with a few jazz influences. Uh, you should check them out. It's mostly instrumental, but they do do some collaborations uh, with uh, some some rappers, and uh, I'll put a link below to the song I was going to play for you, but I completely forgot. You may have also noticed that uh, you know, the videos, the, the production quality has dipped a little bit. Um, just like you, I'm probably uh, in the same position. It, this pattern, it, it takes a toll and it can be hard to kind of find the right balance between uh, taking care of things here at home and getting these videos done. So hopefully one day uh, we will get back to having some uh, interesting intros, but for now, let's get into cohabitation. Okay, right off the bat, wh why is cohabitation bad? Uh, the first thing I want to put out there, big asterisk, is that it is not the worst thing in the world. Uh, I think a lot of times uh, theology teachers, especially you know Catholic uh, high school theology teachers who mean very well, can get so focused on these kind of things that they, they talk about it as if you were to break any one of the, the sexual sins, uh, that's, the last, uh, that's the last straw. Like That's it. You're, you're done at that point. You might as well quit trying to be a holy and good person. Uh, that's not the case at all. Um, that doesn't mean that you should pursue cohabitation as a path forward, but it, it also doesn't mean that um, your brother or your sister who might be cohabiting, or uh, an aunt and uncle, or whatever, uh, you yourself down the road, you're not the worst person in the world because of these actions. That doesn't, however, excuse them as being okay. I just want to clarify that from the beginning, that we're not in the business here of condemning or saying some, someone is a bad person for pursuing a certain course of action. Uh, what we're trying to do is say, if you want the best marriage that you can have, if you want the greatest chance of having a happy and holy marriage that you know your spouse and you um, are both on the same page, working towards that goal of getting each other and any children you might have uh, closer to Christ and getting them to heaven, then I would definitely say cohabitation is not the way to go, <laughs> right? Um, and we're going to look at today the stats. I'm not a big fan of stats. I'm, you can kind of make stats say anything. I'm gonna put a link uh, in the you know, the text notes below this to a website called uh, Spurious Correlations, and it shows how you can take any two kind of random uh, facts and draw some kind of connection to them. Uh, so we're gonna look at the stats though today, but another big asterisk right at the beginning is that the stats don't always tell the whole story. So part two on Friday is gonna be much more of that um, anecdotal personal side. Today it's the objective study side. Okay. So why do people cohabit before marriage? Again, cohabitation just means living with um, someone that you're romantically interested in before marriage. right? Uh, so if you were to live with your girlfriend in college or beyond, uh, that would be cohabitation. It doesn't mean you're necessarily even thinking about getting married. You're just you're living together with the person that you're dating before you're married. right? Um, most of the time you have some sort of uh, quest for authentic self-discovery at play. Like, like um, I gotta figure out who I am first and before I'm ready to get married. And so we're just testing the waters. You know, we're, we're, we're just on this path. We're trying to see if it's right. Uh, you know, we're trying to see if, if we're compatible. Um, again, not evil desires, not bad things, uh, not necessarily making you the worst person in the world. Uh, but what you get is you get this travel narrative. This idea that I need to go out and find myself, some, myself is somewhere out there, and then once I've discovered that, I might be ready for marriage. But until I do that, I'm not ready for marriage, and so cohabitation is sort of what you do when you're not ready for marriage, but you're, you've progressed far enough in your relationship. Uh, this is an image here of one of my favorite TV shows, uh, Psych. It used to be on USA uh, Network. I don't even know if that's still a network. Um, but uh, the idea was uh, this guy, Sean, uh, has um, an incredible memory, like he has a photographic memory, but he pretends to be psychic. His girlfriend, Juliet, is a detective at the Santa Barbara Police Department. 
And just like every other show, when they run out of ideas, they have the people that are dating move in together. And it, they get like a whole season plot line out of that. It happens in How I Met Your Mother three different times with the same person. Um, where you just get an entire season's worth of, of drama from the, the couples moving in together. It's that next step, right? Well, this is one of the reasons why I think cohabitation is the perfect emblem for this course. If you've never thought about these things before, if you've never evaluated your preconceptions, if you don't know why you think what you think about, if you've never reflected on the nature and purpose of marriage, if you've uh, never had any other um, thought about philo philosophical frameworks and the, the true reality of things, well then obviously cohabitation seems like the next step because you're dating, you cohabit, you get married, right? Like it just seems like this logical next step until you actually evaluate those claims, right? Until you check the preconceptions, until you realize, wait, why do I actually think that cohabitation is the next step? It's mostly because of a common mentality, right? Well, everyone else is doing it. Everyone else says that's the next step, so I might as well think it's the next step. Uh, there's a materialistic prejudice there, right? This idea that you're not gonna trust in something like belief, like faith, that, uh, this second mode of accessing reality. You're just gonna trust the things that you can control right in this moment, and if they don't work out, you're in control and you can break it up and you don't have the same pressures as marriage. Everything that we've been talking about in this entire course kind of comes uh, to a head right here. So let's look though then at a few reasons why if you were to evaluate the claims of cohabitation being the next step, do they actually hold up under the weight of evidence? Now, the studies that we're gonna look at are actually studies from uh, secular universities, okay? So these are not studies from uh, the Pope or any commission that he has. These are studies that are commissioned by like University of Columbia, University of South Carolina. Th these are uh, University of Texas at Austin. These are not um, studies done by religious institutions, okay? And what these studies show is that basically people cohabit for two main reasons. One is that they have a low view of marriage, uh, meaning that they don't think marriage is a very important thing or they cohabit for the other reason, uh, the high view of marriage, that marriage is so important that I don't want to screw it up. Both of these reasons, low and high views of marriage, are lenses by which people justify cohabitation. Okay? So don't get this confused and say, if you have a high view of marriage, you won't cohabit. Um, a lot of my friends that pursue cohabitation as an option actually have a very high view of marriage. They, they think marriage is so important they don't want to get it wrong, and so they want to test for compatibility before they're, they're married. Um, some people do have a low view of marriage. Uh, I do have a friend, um, a very good friend, who is cohabiting because he has a low view of marriage. Uh, his, both of, like, his parents are divorced. Uh, his girlfriend's parents are divorced. They don't think marriage means anything. They think it just leads to financial troubles and arguments. And so they say, we don't need the institution of marriage to live in love as we choose. And so they have a very low view of marriage, and that's why they justify a cohabitation. And so you can see on the text, I don't need to read it to you, that you can fall in any of these spectrums and you might still pursue cohabitation. So the question then becomes, well, if, you, like, if both can justify it, what's wrong with it? Like, uh, you can kind of say, like, what, is it, what does it matter then? Um, if you have a low or high view of marriage and you cohabit, maybe it's because it's, it really is the next right thing. So let's take a look at some of the, the steps or the stats.